You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. We're not earth dwellers. We are citizens of another country. We belong to the eternal country, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with His body of glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to the subject of Himself. Literally, the church is the way it says that Dr. Bach puts it, it's a transnational group of people that doesn't have a national identity, and our citizenship is in heaven. With the amount of tension we see growing all around us over identity, race, or otherwise, it can be easy to get caught up in debate. However, as believers and followers of Christ, we would do well to remember that we're not a part of this world. As Pastor Ken will remind you in this message today, our citizenship is of a nation that transcends the ways of this world. In his study, you'll be encouraged to regularly meditate on this reality and to act accordingly as we patiently await the day of the Lord. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter one as he begins his message, How the World as We Know It Ends. This week, we're going to start the book of Revelation. And it's an interesting book. It's basically, it tells us how the world as we know it will end. The whole book is about that. And yet, as the world ends and you get to the end of it, it starts all over again as we have Eden come to earth and then there's a new heaven, a new earth, and everything starts off. So as we look at it today, we're going to be looking at the first three verses. And basically, how did we get here? And where are we going? Why are we talking about the book of Revelation? What's happening that leads us to the point that we need to talk about this book, other than the fact that a lot of people don't want to talk about it? This is one of the most lightly taught books in the church today, and I don't understand why, but it is. A lot of people don't want to teach it, and uh, especially don't want to start talking about the things that are in it, because just be honest, some of this is going to happen within a few years, in my mind. It's moving quickly. So the first three verses... There's a lot there. We're going to be going down a little path here because last week we were talking about the book of Daniel and we start off our trip where we were coming from in the book of Daniel and we were talking there about what it says in Daniel 9, 24, talking about the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks of Daniel, or the 77s as it says in the book. And it takes us all the way to the end of the 69th week or the 69th seven which happened to be in Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. We call it Palm Sunday. That's when Jesus Christ presented himself as king and the nation rejected him. That ended the 69th week. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, starts off a whole new thing that the Bible hinted at, and Paul talks about that a lot. It's called the church age. And in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, we have the, the founding of the church. That's where it starts. It's the day of Pentecost. And at a point in time yet to come, could happen at any second, the book of Revelation has it in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 when John is told by Jesus, come up here. And after we get to Revelation 4, there is one entity that's not talked about again in the book of Revelation until after Christ returns. And that's the church. Because the church isn't on planet earth anymore. The church is with him. So that's the beginning of this time period, but the problem is we don't know, well we know when the tribulation will exactly start. There'll be this peace treaty signed between some guy who's called the Antichrist, the Beast, the Assyrian, he goes by a lot of different names. And from that point to the end is seven years. But from the rapture to when he signs that peace treaty, we don't know how long that is. The Bible doesn't say how long that is. Could be a week, could be A year could be a generation, could be 40 years. We don't know. It's silent. But what we're going to cover in the book of Revelation, though, we cover the church age, including today, all the way to Revelation 21, where it says there will no longer be any curse in the throne of God who is here on planet Earth as well as the Lamb. Everyone is here. In other words, the world has ended, the world has been recreated uh, into what it is that God originally intended in the book of Genesis. So that's kind of the high level outline. I've got a little better one later into the notes. 
But uh, we need to understand where our citizenship is. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, kind of gives us a hint. It says very clearly, our citizenship is in heaven. We don't live on planet earth. You're going to see the word used throughout the book of Revelation called earth dwellers. We're not earth dwellers. We are citizens of another country. We belong to the eternal country from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with His body of glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to the subject of Himself. Literally, the church is the way it says that Dr. Bach puts it, it's a transnational group of people that doesn't have a national identity, and our citizenship is in heaven. So I'm not a citizen of the United States. Actually, I had dual citizenship. I was also a citizen of France and had to go and say, nope, I'm not, I'm not a French citizen anymore. So what happens when your dad's in the service and you get born there. But basically, we are on the side of heaven. We're on the side of God. As believers in Jesus Christ, our citizenship changes. We're no longer dwellers of earth. We're no longer dwellers of planet earth. We no longer are citizens of this planet. We're citizens of God. We're citizens of heaven, and we're adopted children of God, which is what all the scripture tends to tell us. Now, since this is not our home, that means we're doing life as exiles. Do you ever feel like you're exiled here on this planet? Every time I read the news, I feel exiled. I feel like something's going on, and I'm not part of it. We are exiles. That's what the whole book of Daniel was about. Daniel was in exile, and the, Ezekiel's the same thing. Ezekiel was in exile. They were taken from Israel, placed in Babylon, and told, live like a believer in a land of idolaters. And by the way, these are the people who conquered you too. As believers in Jesus Christ, this isn't our home. We shouldn't be real comfortable about it. Okay? Jesus himself tells us that he's preparing a place for us. He says that in John 14 too. And I don't know about you, I've, I've been in structures that have been a couple hundred years old, one that was a thousand years old. Jesus has been working on one for us for 2,000 years. It's going to be great. I mean, you just take one look at planet Earth, which he did in six days. He's been working on our house for 2,000 years. Wow! But just as the nation of Israel was exiled to Babylon, Daniel and Ezekiel show us how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to be faithful to Jesus Christ, even though we're living as exiles. And we have to live this way, as it says in Matthew 24, 42. We have to be on the alert, for we don't know which day our Lord's coming. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are looking forward to the fact that Jesus is going to come and take his church. And we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about that when we get to chapter 4. But he doesn't tell us when that's going to be. Well, are there preconditions for that? No, there are none. Every believer since John wrote this book has been looking forward to Christ returning. Paul was looking forward to it when he wrote the book of Thessalonians. Being on the alert means we've got to be aware of what's going on around us all the time. We've got to find ourselves in a strange place kind of because of that, but at the same time we have to start to figure out how do I think biblically while everybody else is crazy? You think the world's crazy? They are. Is it hard to think biblically? Absolutely. It's tough to do, but we're in a strange place. Let me give you a couple of examples of how weird it is, okay? Health researchers are now using a new tool that's going to help them find the true cause of chronic disease. They're going to use genetics to develop medicine. That's what this is saying. This is from MIT, by the way, just earlier this week. They're employing an innate genetic difference between people, for example, a susceptibility to alcohol or cholesterol levels, to determine what kind of drugs they can manufacture and what they can do. And they're already starting to do this. So they're using genetics to come up with drugs that, that they can then use for purposes of ostensibly making us well. But there's always a dark side to technology, right? When you start developing drugs that use genetics to make you well, they also want to use the genetics to do something else too. And this is what the whole issue about transhumanism is about. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but there is a dark side to technology. And where you see this beginning to show up is with the Pentagon and a group called DARPA, the defense uh, research folks. They're now looking at using genetics to create super soldiers. And they're also looking at AI, artificial intelligence, 
to, and to have drones and robots so that you don't even have to have soldiers on the battlefield. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we'll find in a couple of places that it, if you take a look at the kind of technology we have today with drones and drone swarms and the kinds of things that are being experimented with militarily, we'll see that it's actually referenced in the book of Revelation. It's there. Uh, and so is chemical, biological, and nuclear warfare. It's all in the book of Revelation, all of it. John tries to explain it to us from his viewpoint as an agrarian society in 90 AD. Tough for, tough for him to understand that. There's a race right now going on for genetic-based transformations that can be made to a soldier, as well as mechanically made enhancements that can use artificial intelligence or deep learning plus robotics, and, and what you have is another world called cyber warfare going on too. Uh, transhumanism is just running amok. How serious are they? This is the vice uh, chair of the Arm, Committee on Armed Services. This is General Paul Selva. He makes a reference to the third offset. The first is nuclear weapons. The second is guided munitions. The third is artificial intelligence, robotics, as well as transhuman or genetic changes. And he says implicit in the third offset thinking is the partnership between humans and machines in that space. Machine-to-machine -machine defense of cyber networks is actually an absolute requirement. It's not an implied task. It's an explicit task. If we cannot defend our networks at machine speed, we give our opponents maneuvering space in that domain to defeat us in detail. What he's saying is that it, the, the other powers are already studying this, and some of them are a little bit of a head. China, for example, has publicly declared its intention to be a global leader in AI by 2030, and it's research and recruiting top talent from around the world. They mean to have artificial intelligence flow into the military with no borders whatsoever. Uh, and what that means is the day of the Terminator is not that far away. Okay? In fact, it's actually referenced in the Department of Defense. There is actually a Depar Department of Defense directive dealing with autonomous weapon systems. I figured if they had a directive on it, then they're already thinking about it because this is not classified. I used to deal with the other world, and, and, and when, when it's non-classified, you know there's other stuff going on. Directive 3009.09 seeks to minimize the risk of unintended lethal engagements by requiring positive human interface for all semi-autonomous and autonomous weapon systems. Basically what they're saying is they're still trying to put a person into the decision-making phase, but caution is understandable, but the policy is out of step with the evolving battlefield. In other words, it's, it's going to be automated very, very soon. The book of Revelation has that in it. Uh, what you're seeing is some of the footsteps around that it's actually happening. And they go further. This is another paper written by the Army War College where they talk about autonomous weapon systems. That's what AWS means. And, and they actually say the current debate within the Department of Defense is the Terminator conundrum. Okay, they're using that. They're actually talking about this now at the levels in the Pentagon that we don't even want to think about. So why are we talking about the book of Revelation? Because this is real world stuff. I'm not going into the transhumanist stuff, which is the days of Noah all over again. But we're, we're seeing things go on that, I don't know about you, I read, I read the news and it scares the bejabbers out of me. Sometimes. Other times I'm going like, really? But we know where we're going. We know who wins. I've read the end of the book, okay? We win. But you look at all this, and, and it's kind of like, this is why we're studying the book of Revelation. The chairs are being manipulated and put in place that this is all going to start happening real soon. We're going to see in the book of Revelation autonomous weapon systems, they're there, uh, chemical, biological, and nuclear, nuclear weapon systems as well. Geopolitically, it's terrible. Everybody wants to destroy Israel, I think, except maybe the United States. Israel today moved their embassy out of Paraguay because Paraguay moved their embassy out of Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv. So it's going on right now. It's, it's crazy. Zechariah 12.3 says, It'll come about in that day that I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. What day do you think that is? I think it's today. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, you read the paper. Everybody's against Israel, except the United States, it appears at this point. And Jerusalem is the major issue. 
And when you start talking about monetary policy and the money, you know, the Bible talks about there being a one world financial system. And, and we used to think that's crazy. But monetarily, we're one world monetary crisis away from a single uh, monetary source. Now, I don't know what it's going to be, whether it be the dollar or the Bitcoin, or uh, there's a society in Erie and Jaya that uses yams, so maybe we're all going to be on the yam standard soon. I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that everything's counting down. Do you feel that way? I, everything seems to be moving faster and, and all going the same direction, and it's like the whole world has gone crazy. Uh, and, and everything seems to be pointing that there's a major tipping point in the near future that's going to take place. And the one thing that seems to be left out in all of this is the Bible. Nobody wants to talk about a biblical worldview. They don't care to find out what the biblical worldview is. That's what we do here when we study the scriptures. We want to get a biblical worldview. We want to understand what it is that the Bible is actually teaching us and telling us. The rebellion of Babylon, this is uh, Dr. Lutzer talking about the church in Babylon, which is where we are. Babylon is the world. It's that picture all throughout Scripture. And he says, the rebellion of Babylon is carried on throughout history. The people of those days sacrificed children to pagan gods. We sacrifice our unborn, unborn children on the altar of convenience. We don't bow down before stone gods, but we give wholehearted allegiance to the gods of money, power, and sex. Too often our devotion to God is an add-on. It's something that we do in addition to once, once a week. We call it church. Christians, though, are now a minority in an increasingly hostile culture. We are exiles, not geographically, but morally and spiritually. And Dr. Barna, George Barna, in his recent survey said, a careful study of American core beliefs reveals that we're a nation in transition. We're moving from a Judeo-Christian worldview to a postmodern secular worldview in which there is a new term that we need to be aware of. It's called Christianophobia. People who are afraid of Christians. They are, this is a real word that now exists. It illustrates the characteristics exhibited by people who are doing a survey, and it, it, re it refers to an unreasonable hatred towards fear of conservative Christians. And it's an interesting book to read. So many Christians, so few lions. Uh, you know, it, but the whole thing talks about what's going on in our nation today. People are going crazy. Jesus talks about it when he gives his briefing to the uh, disciples on Mount, the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 24, verses 6 to 12, he says, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened. For those things must take place, but that's not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there'll be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they'll deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's loves will grow cold. I'm not going to go too deep into that. But wars and rumors of wars, per Jesus, is just a normal state of affairs in the fallen world. We're always going to have wars and rumors of wars. But he talks about another kind of war in Matthew 24 that had never been seen before. It was nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. When you go back and you study that, that had never happened before. That is a, an idiom used in Hebrew that points to world war. When did the first world war happen? Have we had that? It's called World War I, right? The war to end of all wars, which is what World War I was, didn't. It didn't end any war. It just started the clock. Based on what Jesus said, nation against nation, that's the beginning of the clock. It has started ticking. That war in itself, just by itself, based on terms of military combatants, resulted in 8.5 million dead, they think. They're not real sure. It was horrible. But what happened from World War I? When you start studying it and you start looking at what's happening in the world and what things are taking place, the Russian Empire collapsed and the Russian Revolution resulted in the Soviet Union. The Ottoman Turk Empire collapsed and all the things necessary for Israel to become a nation began uh, in, at the end of World War I. 
the Austrian-Hungarian Empire collapsed. The German Empire collapsed and the United States began to rise. And then in World War II, we got a new term for warfare. It was called genocide. Adolf Hitler's the one that came up with that. He tried to destroy every Jew on the planet and succeeded in killing one-third of them. By the way, we'll find out as we study in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation time period, it will be two-thirds of every Jew on the planet who will be killed, not one-third. But his final solution killed almost 6.2 million Jews. As a result of that, we saw Ezekiel 36 and 37 become fact. Israel became a nation at the end of World War II. My great-grandfather was always looking forward to, well, I'm not, Jesus is coming soon, but Israel's got to be in the land. Jesus is coming soon, but Israel's got to be in the land. Israel's in the land. Jesus is coming soon. He was, he was convinced Jesus was coming immediately. Even when I, I remember him saying it in the, in the mid-50s as a child. Uh, and he only spoke German too. So the fact that I could still remember it and spoke only German is amazing to me. But Israel's back in the land. That is the singular super sign that we are in the end of the age. Israel's back in the land. Have been since 1948. Uh, there's a separate, there's a, sec, there's a, a study that, that we did several years ago where we took a look at the time periods that the scripture says for Israel to be out of the land. And then there was additional punishment added. And we talked about that in that study as well. And we find out that they entered the land and became a nation on the exact day they were supposed to. And they took over the Temple Mount in 1967 on the exact day they were supposed to. Uh, in alignment to things that happened way back in 500 B.C. It's just amazing. But the land itself is in perpetual refusal to give peaceful and secure home to any Gentiles. Anybody who's gone into it prior to Israel going into it, it didn't do anything for them. It was always a horrible place to live. Mark Twain actually went there on a tour in the late 1800s and said it was a horrible, horrible place. Nothing grew. It was a desert. Dr. Seiss in 1901 wrote this and he said, yeah, Israel's got to be in the land. At some point in time, the blessing can't be delayed forever. They're going to be in the land. Well, they're in the land. We are now in the period of time, as we start talking about the book of Revelation, that Jesus discussed in Matthew 24 and 25. In fact, he talked about it more than anything else, other than hell. He talked about hell more than he talked about the end of the age. We are in the period of time leading up to the beginning of the 70th seven, the 70th week that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel has a vision, he's given a vision of how God will deal with Israel. The way prophets in the Old Testament saw things is there was called a mountain peak experience. They would have a prophecy here and a prophecy here, but they wouldn't see what was in between. Jesus actually did that when he quoted from the book of Isaiah and then stopped at a comma. The rest of it's over here at his second coming. Well, we're seeing the same thing in the book of Daniel. The 70th week is about ready to start. It just takes a, somebody to write a peace treaty. Daniel 9, 27, he, the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago and we went into depth on that but that that is yet to occur that's going to happen about three and a half years after peace treaty signed when the guy will be doing this you've been listening to a message from revelation on the unsafe bible Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this final book of the Bible. If you're into fantasy or sci-fi, you might be naturally drawn toward Revelation. There's all kinds of imagery and strange creatures that are described. But more than any of this, you're reminded of the preeminence of God and that He rules over everything. He rules over all people, nations, and He has more power than the evil that can try to take over the world. What a relief that you can know and trust in this God. Are you confused about anything you heard today? Don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. Once there, 
go to the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. Then you can fill out a form for us to get in touch with you. To listen to this message or any others from this series in Revelation, just look under the Media tab at the unsafebible.com. You'll also find additional teachings in other books of the Bible. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you have the opportunity to help support the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. We're grateful for any donation given to help further the message of the gospel. Any other questions? Feel free to explore the unsafebible.com. For more information about when and where we meet, we're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and would be happy to meet you. Join us again here for another message from the book of Revelation on the Unsafe Bible.